Good morning. I want to welcome everyone to today's discussion. It's titled Regenerative Medicine, Highlighting and Correcting Misinformation. I just want to thank everyone who joined us today in person. It's really excited to see all your faces again after so long. But I also wanted to welcome everyone who joined us online via Zoom. My name is Kirsten Matthews. I'm the Fellow for Science and Technology Policy at the Baker Institute. I'm the Director of the Science and Technology Policy Program and the Biomedical Research Program at the Center for Health and Biosciences. Today's event is actually a collaboration between Baker Institute Center for Health and Biosciences and the Texas Heart Institute, which is located in the Texas Medical Center. It's part of an annual lecture series between these two institutions that was started in 2016 and has been funded by a grant by the George and Mary Josephine Hammond Foundation, which we're eternally grateful for. It's a collaborative series to discuss policy issues important to Texas and Houston in addition, we feel like it's also to honor the, doctor, the late Dr. James Willerson, the former president of the Texas Heart Institute and the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston. He was an amazing doctor and a cardiologist, a great science advocate, and an inspiration to myself as, when, as many others. Before I start, I would like to thank our Baker Institute staff, especially Serena Storm, Caitlin May, Daniel Morali, for their support organizing today's event, as well as my collaborators at the Texas Heart Institute, Carrie Sprung and Dr. Emerson Perrin. As noted, this morning's event is going to be held live both at the Baker Institute and via Zoom. To help coordinate these two platforms, we request that questions be submitted online via Google Form. If you're in person, you can see there's QR codes at the table. One gives you access to agenda and the other to get for questions. If you're online, we'll be posting that link uh, several times for you so that you can post directly to it. Feel free to submit as many questions as you want. You could just do the form over and over and over again. If there's a general question, you can just do one to, or to specific speaker and indicate who that is. So let's get to the program. Moderating today's discussion is Dr. Emerson Perrin. Dr. Perrin is a practicing interventional cardiologist and the medical director at the Texas Heart Institute as well as the director for the Texas Heart Institute's Center for Clinical Research and Stem Cell Center. He also holds appointments as the director of interventional cardiology and medical director of the Cardiac Catheterization Laboratories, those are big words, at Baylor St. Luke Medical Center. Dr. Perrin has led the field in clinical work on regenerative medicine for cardiac treatments. He is also a strong collaborator for this series and I would consider him a civic scientist someone who uses his knowledge and skills, in this case medicine, to promote science as a public good and to support strong science-based public policy. It's been an honor to work with Dr. Perrin, Dr. Perrin these past few years. He has been an excellent successor to Dr. Willerson's legacy in health policy. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Perrin to the stage. Well, thank you, Kristen, and uh, thank all of you for, for being here this morning in person and, and online as well. And first, uh, just a few words uh, about Dr. Willerson. Uh, he was just an amazing guy, so I'll just have to say a little something. He was my mentor uh, for many years. He initially uh, went to UT. He was a swimmer at UT. He had a T-ring. He was very proud of that. He went to uh, studied medicine at Harvard. Um, he then became, was the, subsequently the chair of medicine at University of Texas, and then the president and medical director of the Texas Heart Institute. Um, the book, the big cardiology book, that was his book. He published hundreds of patients, uh, of uh, papers, and just an outstanding uh, scientist and clinician. But uh, probably most of all, he's an extremely caring physician. Um, very different from anything you'll see now. He took all of his calls at any time. So uh, if a nurse had a small detail of an abnormal laboratory at four o'clock in the morning, he got the call and he would answer very politely and thank them and tell them what to do. And he did this all his life. It's, it's truly amazing. We uh, really miss him and he was part of initiating some of these efforts. So, um, we have an excellent panel for you this morning, uh, and, and we have um, uh, Dr. Masters and Dr. Vraga joining us from Minnesota. Uh, today's lectures will focus on an issue that many of us 
uh, I think, are concerned about uh, in the stem cell field, but also broadly uh, during the pandemic, which is how to address misinformation and misconceptions about science and medicine. And that's something that's, that's very pervasive in our society now. There have been many times when I, as a, a physician, uh, listening to a patient, um, and maybe that patient's discuss, uh, discussing some intervention that I've never heard of, uh, probably should have never heard of, or that I do know about, that I know is terrible, or that I know is not a good thing. And, um, and patients, uh, they do their research, they get tons of information, but they're really bombarded by information from everywhere. TV, online, um, you name it, uh, everybody's getting all this information and it's hard many times for people to discern what's valid, what's not. Um, so when I face these kind of things in the office, you're always confronted with, do I just give this, you know, take 15 minutes and give this patient a lecture about and trying to set him straight about what he's thinking about? Or do I just give him alternative sources of information where he can get more, uh, uh, increase his knowledge? Or um, should I just critique his sources of information? So there's many ways to handle this. And I think uh, uh, in today's panel, our, our speakers will provide examples of how information is being disseminated, how physicians and others are responding to misinformation, and how to best address misinformation. So we have two speakers joining us uh, online via Zoom. Um, first speaker is Dr. Uh, Zubin Master. Uh, Dr. Master is an associate professor of biomedical ethics at the Biomedical Ethics Research Program and the Center for Regenerative Medicine at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He's also a non-resident scholar in the Center for Health and Biosciences here at the Baker Institute. Dr. Master's research interests broadly cover ethical and policy issues related to regenerative medicine and stem cell research, genetics, research ethics, and the responsible conduct of research. <clears throat> His latest research focuses on the translation and commercialization of stem cell interventions and the direct-to-consumer market of FDA unapproved stem cell treatments. More specifically, he aims to understand how personal beliefs and attitudes impact patients' healthcare decision making and a desire to undertake experimental or unproven regenerative inter interventions. So, welcome, Dr. Master, and without further ado, you have the podium virtually. Thank you, Dr. Perrin, for the introduction. So, um, let me just start then. Okay. Everyone can, oh, you cannot see my screen. My bad, sorry. Can you see my screen now? You can? Okay, good. All right, so I'll talk about misinformation uh, regarding the unproven stem cell. I'm gonna use the words unproven stem cell therapies, unproven stem cell interventions, stem cell treatments very interchangeably and how to better inform patients. So just to um, go a little over what Dr. Perrin actually mentioned, some of the characteristics of this unproven stem cell treatment market, mainly people that um, come to this market are older, elderly population, right? These are the people that are most affected by degenerative disorders and conditions. There has been uh, quite a bit of physical, emotional, and you know financial harms that uh, befall some of these patients who have gotten an unproven stem cell treatment. Uh, the third bullet just kind of goes over some of the adverse events. Some, some of these are pretty serious. There have been deaths, uh, heart attacks, uh, blindness, uh, tumors that have been caused from uncontrolled stem cell growth. Now, this is a worldwide industry. It's international. It's found in many, many countries. I'd probably argue that the U.S. is perhaps the largest market, and it's been growing. Um, you can see in the last bullet that we now have over 2,700 clinics in the U.S. alone. So um, if the column on the right is, is the uh, area I just want you to pay attention, most of the people that are getting these unproven stem cell treatments are getting them for treating some type of pain 
uh, generally from an orthopedic issue or an orthopedic injury. So you see a lot in orthopedics and sports medicine, but people get it for ALS. They get it for cerebral palsy. They get it for Parkinson's disease. People get it for uh, an unproven stem cell treatment for COPD or some type of vision impairment or potentially cardiovascular. Uh, a lot of times after a stroke or heart, heart attack as well. So there has been a fair bit of misinformation or disinformation in advertising. So again, this is a direct-to-consumer, primarily online market, at least uh, when it comes to the advertisements. So most of it is on the clinic's website. So of, of these 2,700 clinics, you can see some of these slick looking websites. They look really professional, uh, but they also distribute flyers. They can give, um, you know, they, they, they may be on social media. They uh, uh, sometimes have seminars as well. They promote all kinds of misinformation. They even actively try to promote distrust, for example, in FDA and other regulatory agencies. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to make their stem cell intervention look scientifically legit. They do this in many ways. Let's look at a couple of these advertisements. So this is a seminar flyer uh, that I easily just found on the internet. You can see that they're trying to basically um, talk about getting a stem cell therapy for a range of different orthopedic conditions. Now, interestingly, if you pay attention to this part right here, it says, you know, before you operate, before you medicate, regenerate, right? So they're playing on some of the emotions that people have where they, uh, they think that stem cells are natural and therefore they are somehow superior or better than drugs um, and that drugs cause, you know, uh, side effects. Uh, and then, of course, they play on people's fears of getting a, an operation for, let's say, their knee osteoarthritis or something like that. And they'll say, you know, regenerate prior to you getting the, uh, the um, operation. Here's another advertisement. You can see uh, this is from a Florida clinic. Uh, there has never been any clinical study to show that after a stem cell treatment, uh, where you have bone on bone knee osteoarthritis. This is very painful and it uh, uh, happens to a lot of people, especially as they age. There's no evidence to show that you get this sort of regeneration of this uh, area over here. But they're showing basically most likely two different x rays. I'm not a diagnos diagnostician, but um, you know, um, maybe two different x rays just to kind of give the idea that look, it, it, it happens. So there was a nice study that was done at Arizona State University that looked at these different clinic websites to uh, ask the question, what kind of evidence is being presented to patients? Now, many scientists like us, we really like to see things in clinical trials. We like to see peer-reviewed scientific papers. And there, there are some there, but let, I'll, I'll unpack that a, a little bit in a second. Um, most, of, most of it is you know, convincing people that they have great qualified providers, that they sometimes talk about sort of the technical aspects of stem cell procedures, and patient testimonials are by far the way they sell these unproven treatments to, um, you know, to consumers, to patients. Uh, interesting, of the 35% that actually have some scientific data, most of the scientific data that they're putting on their websites has nothing to do with the treatments they offer. Uh, some of them are on animal studies or cultured cells, or even if it is clinical data, um, it's, it's not robust. They don't have a control group. Only 2% out of that 35% was actually pertinent to the type of treatment that they're offering. So most of it is bunk. So we call this we call this tokens of legitimacy, right? The idea that they're trying, providers are trying to make their unproven stem cell intervention look like they're scientifically legit. They do this again by having a prestigious board of clinical advisors. They may register their trial on clinicaltrials.gov, making it seem like it's a cutting edge experimental treatment. Uh, again, we talked about publications, and the main way they sell these uh, to patients is through patient stories, patient testimonials of efficacy of these treatments. So we did a study on YouTube where we wanted to look at patient testimonials. We chose YouTube. Well, a lot of people watch YouTube uh, is one reason, but also YouTube is one social media platform that appeals more so to an older and elderly population, which are the people that are probably seeking regenerative treatments. We also wanted to study um, um, you know, patient testimonials on YouTube because they are narratives. Narratives are, are stories. And, um, there's uh, several studies that actually show that, you know, stories are potentially even more persuasive at changing health behavior and, and, and conveying health information. Um, also, we chose YouTube because it's a video-based platform and video may appeal to a lower health literacy population. 
So what we did was we analyzed 159 videos in these five areas, ALS, cerebral palsy, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, and spinal cord injury. What we found is that almost all of these videos were uploaded by these unproven stem cell clinic providers. So we looked at who produced it and we went back and traced that. Almost all of them also were patient to patient peer-to-peer -peer type of communication. So we assume that many of these viewers are going to be patients, um, uh, probably with the same type of diseases. So this is a little bit of the metadata, you know, the average um, the length of the videos, the subscribers. And like other studies done in this space, uh, a lot of them don't talk about the risks, they don't mention the costs, and they, they don't call these unproven stem cells experimental or that they need ethics or regulations. Now, uh, we analyze all kinds of things, but I just want to pay attention to some of the, the major themes that we found, okay? So the major themes were that 91% of the videos we analyzed uh, showed that the patient showed some type of overall benefit or improvement in their quality of life or specific improvements. A lot of patients have said that, you know, my conventional medicine provider basically never gave me any hope. There was nothing I can they can do anymore. But the unproven stem cell provider, the clinic, that gave them a lot of hope. So, you know, it, it, it gave them the hope that they were looking for. Over half of the um, these videos talked to, uh, had patients praising the provider, and I'm going to unpack that in a second. And almost a third of them recommended to the viewer, again, possibly another patient, that they should go and get a stem cell treatment. Um, and, and that's, again, a very powerful sort of message. So, to unpack praise, these were just some of the, the words that we found, you know, my provider is fantastic, knowledgeable, they are, they are my savior. Here's a couple of quotes, uh, you know, like the second one was from an MS patient. I thank you, I love you because you're my extended family for making me well again, thanks. And a couple of short phrases as well. So we concluded that, you know, these patient testimonials that are given by these unproven stem cell treatment uh, clinics are, are really powerful because they're stories. And, you know, as, you know, I, I know Dr. Uh, Vraga was, is going to talk about source credibility a little bit, but the, it may be a really powerful way when a patient who's suffering the same type of illness as the viewer is conveying that message. That could be a really powerful and persuasive way to um, talk about this type of health information and give the idea that these unproven stem cell treatments are legit. So if we look at patient um, sort of patient perceptions, there have been several studies, but the sum of it is that most of the patients who have gotten an unproven stem cell treatment are pretty happy about their results. Um, and uh, so, you know, most of these are positive reviews. Uh, we're, we are seeing some negative reviews, but it, it just hasn't been published as much. Um, and a lot of these patients have also done their own research. They go online, they engage the medical system, they talk to the providers, and they feel that they're very well informed prior to undertaking it. Now, this is just some preliminary data that we've uh, started to talk about, uh, we've started to collect, and it's a, basically a concept map. And what I want to show you is that there's many, it's complex as to how and or why people get an unproven stem cell treatment, right? So for example, maybe they might not have high literacy skills, right? They may not know that it takes a long time for drugs uh, to become medicine, uh, sorry, for um, stem cells to become actual medicine or that, you know, the FDA is trying to help them not, you know, uh, discourage uh, them. Uh, trust was a major, um, uh, theme that we found that, you know, uh, high seekers of, of stem cell treatments may have less trust or distrust in the medical establishment, distrust in the FDA, and they may place higher trust in the stem cell provider or maybe even, uh, you know, uh, their family or, or, or co-workers. And all of these types of things can actually impact whether they think that an unproven stem cell treatment is going to be effective for them. Another major theme is desperation. You know, a lot of patients felt abandoned by the medical system. They felt they had nothing to lose but to try an unproven treatment. And another theme is that they, they, they felt that if they didn't try it, they would have some kind of regret. So all of these things can impact one's intent either to go or not get an unproven stem cell treatment. Keep that in mind as I close my, my last couple of slides. So there have been quite a bit of education that's out there, but most of this education is, you know, 
It's, it's patient booklets, as you can see here, or potentially text-based education that's online. Now, a lot of people have touted that, you know, maybe education has certain limits, but I think they're thinking of this type of didactic education because they, they said, oh, you know, no one, basically, you can't just give people information and they're going to rationally weigh and say, oh, yes, uh, I'm going to behave this way. That's not really how we make health decisions all the time. A lot of times, uh, health decisions are made uh, based on also emotion and, and other, other factors. So we've you know, started to consider what type of education for patients might be really persuasive, really good. So the, the didactic education, which is the education that we see mostly in this unproven stem cell uh, space, again, is very fact-based. It has this, some of them has this, what, what I call a finger wagging tone. It kind of says, no, don't do it. There's danger. You're going to get harmed. And that may kind of, you know, peeve off a uh, potential patient. Um, and then per there's persuasive communication. And I think persuasive communication is the way to go here. We're trying to elicit behavior change, but at minimum, we're trying to say, hey, think twice about it before you make a decision, okay? We're, we're going to use something like, uh, like credible sources, maybe, you know, use a patient to convey an information as opposed to an expert, maybe use narratives. Um, I'll talk a little bit about corrections, uh, but I'm not going to talk about inoculus, but I know uh, Dr. Braga will. Um, it, maybe even soft emotional appeals, but the idea is we're not infringing on their cognitive reasoning. And then this is the, me this is the type of you know, messaging that we get from the unproven stem cell providers, which we deem is unethical. And that's really this manipulative messaging where, where it's highly deceptive. You're hijacking your reasoning skills. Literally the tactics use like lying, omitting information or potentially exaggerating truths. So, you know, we, we've just, uh, you know, conceptualized this idea and we're, we're starting to uh, develop education. So, what can this persuasive education look like? Here's just a couple of ideas. Remember, I, I mentioned in one of the flyers, there's this naturalness fallacy that because stem cells are come from your body, they're natural and therefore they're safer and better than drugs or surgery. We can easily correct that those types of incorrect facts. Um, people that are desperate, they feel they have nothing to lose. Well, maybe we can somehow tell them you can get harmed. You can get ripped off. Uh, you can lose hope. And maybe you may actually be ineligible for a legit clinical trial if it should uh, you know, come. And other things we can consider, again, source credibility, which sources are more credible to a patient? Could it be an expert? Could it be a patient? Maybe both. Uh, potentially using narratives as a more powerful way of communicating health information. Also to use empathy, recognize that the patients are struggling here. They're, they're really looking for something. So don't use that finger wagging tone. And then of course, respect the patient's autonomy, right? No one wants to be told you can't go and get an unproven stem cell treatment if they really want to. So maybe make it about, you know, we want to arm you with the right information so you can make the best decision for your healthcare. So that's pretty much it. I just want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Matthews for the invite again and uh, for my colleagues, uh, some of our funders, and uh, want to single out uh, you know, Omar Kawam and Xuan Zhu for a lot of the preliminary data I presented. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Master, for that uh, excellent uh, presentation. Um, and I know I have a lot of comments and questions already, but, um, and I know many of you also probably have questions as well. So uh, please feel free to, to go ahead and, and post the questions on the Google form. There's a QR code on, on each table you can use, which will take you to the page. And we have posted the link in Zoom for our online attendees. Uh, you can post on the forum as many times as you want with questions for each panelist or for everyone to address together. Okay, for our second speaker, I'd like to welcome Dr. Emily Vraga, who's also joining us via Zoom. Uh, Dr. Vraga is an associate professor in the Hubbard School of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of Minnesota, where she holds the Don and Carol Larson Professorship in Health Communication. Her research examines how to detect and correct health misinformation on social media, how to use news literacy messages to limit biasing processing, inoculate against misinformation, and improve news consumption habits, and how to encourage attention to more diverse political and health content online. Dr. Vraga has worked with 
several international health organizations and social media platforms to improve efforts to address misinformation online. We're excited to have Dr. Varga join us this morning and I'm especially interested to hear about her evidence-based recommendations on effectively combating misinformation online and social media where it is quite present these days. So without further ado, Dr. Varga. Thank you. All right, um, thank you all for having me here today, um, here being, of course, a relative term. Uh, Dr. Master spoke to us about uh, stem, uh, stem cell therapies. In particular, I'm going to broaden the lens in one respect and talk about health misinformation more generally, as well as narrow it and focus specifically on the question of social media and how social media is responsible for the spread of misinformation, but also can be an opportunity for us to correct it in meaningful ways. So we have a lot of reason to be concerned about misinformation in a lot of spaces, right? This is not a social media specific problem, but there are reasons to be especially worried about the ways in which social media and the way it is structured can reinforce the likelihood that somebody sees misinformation and believes it. We don't have gatekeepers on social media, and that's deeply related to this idea there are very few source cues. So information from a highly credible, highly respected scientific source looks pretty much exactly the same as information from a stem cell therapy website that has you know, commercial incentives to misrepresent data. And people, regular people who are on social media, not usually for information, but for social purposes, might not be able to tell those two apart and give them e equal weight. And so misinformation looks a lot like credible information. Because we're on social media, we're not wearing our critical thinking hat. Instead, we're wearing like our social hat. And we're thinking about prioritizing personal narratives, thinking about authenticity as one of the primary criteria by which we judge information. This offers an opportunity for those who wish to manipulate us to use those personal narratives um, and to, to mislead. There's just so much information, right? There's so much information, it's coming at us constantly. And it's really difficult, like I said, to, to distinguish what is true and what is false. So when people are faced with a ton of information, it doesn't make them think more critically. Instead, it does the opposite. We feel overloaded. We rely even more on simplistic cues to help us make judgments about credibility. Misinformation can be very emotional, and because it's very much emotional, it's much more viral. So there have been several studies that have documented misinformation spreads more quickly than accurate information on social media because it's emotional, because it's novel. Reality constrains accurate information. We've seen things like this before because reality doesn't change all that quickly. Misinformation is, can be completely made up and therefore completely new to us. The information environment itself is constantly evolving. So things that work one day to correct misinformation or to limit its spread might not work the next. That changes how we engage with social media. And finally, even for health issues, we're increasingly facing a politicized and polarized environment where people are coming into these decisions thinking as a Democrat or as a Republican, thinking about their identities, thinking about what their political elites are telling them is the appropriate behavior, rather than necessarily what their doctors or medical professionals or health organizations are telling them. Now, there's a ton of different solutions that are proposed for dealing with this problem. Um, so Dr. Master talked on the touched on the idea of education, building literacy, helping people understand, for example, how science is conducted, how medicine happens, what it means to, to be a proven therapy versus not, as well as inoculation, helping people recognize common misleading tactics. We can also talk about ways to promote high quality information so that the first thing people see is good information rather than bad information, misleading information. And to do that might require regulation. But all of these solutions are very much long-term in nature. They deal with the problem of misinformation that has been with us forever and will be with us forever. So they're important components, but they don't deal with the misinformation that is circulating right now on social media. The things that we can do to respond to bad actors, to bad information that is already out there. And that is what correction does. Because correction is responding to misinformation. 
And you can do that using three tactics. And these tactics are not, of course, separate. Sometimes you can use multiple and can be more effective in doing so. So sometimes it's about telling people what is in fact true. It's giving them the facts of a situation. It's telling them, we know the COVID vaccine is safe and effective because we have done all this testing. We have followed these protocols. It's building on um, decades of, of previous research about vaccines. It can be about describing misleading tactics. It can be telling people, we know that a really common tactic that's been used over and over and over again in propaganda and misinformation campaigns is false experts making people look like they have expertise, look like they have uh, an ability to speak to an issue when really they don't, or attacking the expertise of those who really do. So um, my doctor is just as good as your doctor, even if my doctor doesn't have the expertise in that field and is paid by me to say certain things. So source credibility is an important part of that. Telling people, helping people recognize especially when sources have some kind of vested interest, whether that's political, whether that's financial, whether that's social, um, whether it's a little bit of all of those. So that's correction. What social media adds that is unique is the idea of observed correction, right? And observed correction happens when people who see a correction of somebody else reduce their own misperceptions as a result. So often when we think about correction, we think about one person talking to somebody else. We think about the person sharing the misinformation and me trying to respond to them and say, hey, 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 actually the facts are this, here's the technique being used and here's why it's being used. And that's really important. And research shows that it can work. It can help reduce misperceptions. That being said, the person you're talking to is in some ways the hardest person to convince. They're the person who is so committed to the misinformation. They are already in your clinic, or in the case of social media, they are sharing it on social media, putting their name or their avatar behind this and thus feeling committed to it. They might be very much resistant to change. What social media changes is the audience. There is a much broader audience who is seeing this interaction, who might not be nearly as convinced and thus more reachable, more persuadable more open to accurate evidence. So when you correct somebody else on a public platform, you can potentially reach an audience who is much more receptive to that correction. Now, observed correction doesn't have to happen on social media. If I say something inaccurate right now and Dr. Master corrects me in the Q&A, all of you will have witnessed that. You will have observed that and know the correct information as a result. But the opportunities for it to happen in offline spaces are much more limited. We often don't have large audiences of people. And with virality and the way social media platforms work, a single correction can reach dozens of people or even hundreds of people. And depending on who it comes from, it could be from a source that is deeply credible. So observed correction has this potential. The two questions we have to ask is, does it happen? And if it happens, is it effective? So to answer the first question, we've collected a lot of survey data look, asking people, have you seen this happen on social media? Have you seen somebody sharing misinformation being corrected or being told they're wrong? So we started by asking this in 2019 across four different countries, whether this had happened on social media in the past month. And you can see these numbers are mildly um, optimistic, right? Somewhere between a quarter and a third, roughly across the US, the UK, France, and Canada said, yeah, I saw this happen in the past month on social media. With the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic, we wanted to see, okay, well, is this happening for COVID-19? And what we see is this increasing trend that yes, we're seeing this in the past week. So we're tightening the time frame and saying, has this happened in the specific context of COVID? And it's about half of people who are saying this by the time we get to fall of 2020 or spring of 2021. It also happens for politics. And I bring that up because of this idea that medicine is increasingly politicized. We need to recognize that sometimes a correction can be political, sometimes it's health, sometimes it's a little bit of both, especially when we think about COVID-19. Now, this was just asking people if they saw a correction, but you can only see correction if you see misinformation. So if we ask people, have you seen misinformation? And then only look at people who have seen misinformation and ask whether they've seen correction, these numbers get quite a bit higher. So it suggests that there's a lot of this back and forth happening on social media. And this is important because one of the reasons social media matters for correction is 
despite all these claims about echo chambers, and echo chambers can be very much real, our social media feeds actually remain much more diverse than a lot of our offline spaces, as social sorting happens increasingly, as increasingly the people we work with, the people we live near, the people we interact with on a daily basis are more and more similar to us, the harder it is for corrections to happen. They are likely to have similar misperceptions. Social media remains a place where we see a lot of these interactions for good and for evil. We can all think of that, that crazy uncle, I have one too, who is sharing vaccine misinformation or stem cell misinformation or flu vaccine misinformation. So what's happening on social media, the, the next and probably most important question is, does this work? So we've done over eight experimental data collections um, over the past six years. And what we have found is it does. It works very consistently to produce relatively small changes in attitudes. So it's worked when we've studied the question of whether Zika was actually being caused by genetically modified mosquitoes for whether fluoride in the drinking water is going to uh, reduce your intelligence, whether you can eat GMO foods and whether they're safe to consume, whether the flu vaccine will give you the flu. And this is one where it didn't work quite so well. And I can talk more about that. Whether raw milk is, is just as safe and more nutritious than pasteurized milk. Uh, interestingly, whether sunscreen is going to give you cancer, where it didn't work, and I am happy to talk about that one too, and whether you can take a hot bath and prevent getting COVID, right? So it works for the most part. Where doesn't it work or where does it work less well? Well, part of this is about what social media platforms themselves are doing. We only said that observed correction works, so to speak, when it leaves the audience with lower misperceptions than if they had seen absolutely no misinformation on the topic. In other words, we expose them to misinformation and then also a correction and said, we only think this correction is effective is not if it just mitigates the misinformation, but actually leaves you better off than if you had seen no misinformation on the topic. So those two cases where it doesn't work, it still works to reduce the effects of the misinformation. It's just the misinformation itself is quite persuasive. And this is especially true to Dr. Master's points about YouTube videos for sunscreen, where we had a video persuasive communication from somebody calling themselves a doctor making these outlandish claims that sunscreen is going to damage your DNA, cause cancer, um, lead to aging, and all of these other things. And we had very small textual comments that very few people actually said they saw. When we limit, start limiting it to people who saw those corrections, they were much more effective. But that speaks to the need to think about platforms and their role and the ways in which corrections can and cannot um, be prioritized. Across these studies, we've come up with a number of best practices. So if you see misinformation on social media, what you should do is correct or react. This means that one correction might not be enough. So one of the things people often say is, well, somebody else has corrected it, so I don't need to. That's actually not the case. When you have multiple corrections, it tends to be more effective. And this is especially true if they're not coming from highly expert sources. Dr. Master already talked about being empathetic, being understanding. We have all shared misinformation. I know I've done it. I bet most of you have. It happens, right? Information, misinformation is just being wrong about something. We've all done it. So being empathetic, being understanding, saying, I understand why you might be confused, makes that correction much more palatable and is equally effective in reducing misperceptions. Don't just tell people something's wrong, but tell them what's right. Tell them what's correct. Explain um, the information environment using a credible source, which credibility is such a fraught concept. When it comes to social media, what matters most is actually trust. Expertise does matter. We want expert sources, but we're even more reliant on people we trust. And then faster is better, right? We need to, we need to respond quickly before people start believing the misinformation, build up their psychological defenses to correction. So even as I say this, this doesn't mean we have to go out and be a warrior every time we see misinformation on social media. We can be strategic in thinking about when correction is appropriate versus when we need to inoculate people. So when we think misinformation is likely, that's where providing warnings and explaining misleading tactics can be really effective. So thinking about laying the groundwork for the COVID vaccine, vaccine misinformation isn't new. And we had a really good sense of what 
types of tropes were going to be brought out over and over again, explaining those, building the foundation that, yes, it seems fast, but it's built on all of these years of, of research, um, for example, can be very effective. But once misinformation is out there and people are seeing it, we want to respond with the facts. We want to respond empathetically, and we want to respond publicly so others can see it. To conclude, we saw this, this, this model really spoke to me when thinking about pandemic responses, that any one solution is not enough. Any one solution has gaps. And so what we need is a lot of different solutions. And the same is true for misinformation, that we need media literacy, we need inoculation, we need people to better understand how science and medicine works. We need uh, platforms to be doing more, whether that's deplatforming to known bad actors, whether it's making corrections very salient, whether it's labeling high quality sources. And then we need correction because all of those are still going to fail. There is still going to be misinformation out there. So I wanna also acknowledge my fantastic collaborators and some of our funders. Thank you. And I look forward to talking more in the Q&A. Okay, thank you, Dr. Vraga. So uh, we have some time for uh, questions, and um, you um, can use the QR codes and um, or the link in Zoom to post your questions. And and I already see some here. I would just start with my initial question as a physician encountering uh, people, uh, different kinds of people that may have. Uh, misinformation. Uh, sometimes you see uh, some of this is sort of judgment in, in person, though. You can are sometimes able to judge character, but um, how do you break the barrier when people are seem to be non-responsive to, to correction? Is it possible? I'll ask that to Dr. Fraga. So in-person is going to offer a lot of advantages as compared to social media. That in-person interaction where you can engage in empathetic, active listening, really understand the root of their concern and be able to speak to the, the deeper fears. So I thought that the idea that people feel hopeless or that they're left out of the system when they're seeking these alternative therapies is really important because even just being heard might help reach them. It's also an ongoing conversation. Sometimes one conversation isn't going to be enough. And we all have those experiences. I have family members who still are not vaccinated against COVID-19. And there are times even my most empathetic conversations go nowhere. So I think it's also maintaining our sense of efficacy and realizing that there are people who are easier to reach and harder to reach and trying to identify the spaces in which we can reach people who are willing to listen, as well as leaving doors open for those who, at least at first, aren't willing to listen to us. Thank you, Dr. Vraga. So I'll, I'll address some of the questions from the audience. So for Dr. Master, treatments offered abroad add complexity to regulating this market. How common are these treatments being offered abroad that are illegal in the USA? Uh, they're pretty frequent. Uh, the clinics that are offering treatments abroad are also similar to the types of treatments that are being offered over here. It's uh, it's hard to regulate this industry. We did a study to show that most of these clinics are small. Um, and, you know, the FDA is about 15,000 people. They cannot enforce the entire industry of 2,700 clinics. Um, so, you know, the, even the FDA is trying to use sort of information or, or correction types of tactics uh, to be able to uh, reach uh, more people. But um, yeah, it's, it, it's a sort of brave new world. There's a lot of unproven stem cells uh, treatments out there and people are going to look for them. And um, you know, if they, they really want to control their condition and improve their health, um, they may not take it sitting down and may uh, go and get one. Thank you. Um, yes, in my personal experience, sometimes things are kind of logical. You can tell a patient, Listen, if you have to go to Cancun to get this cell treatment, uh, <laughs> Cancun is, is not exactly the, uh, the mecca of healthcare. So, but some, things, some people understand logical things like that. So here's a question from the audience for both of you. Are there sanctions by regulators, litigators, and medical associations like the AMA to stop these fraudulent healthcare service providers? What are they? 
Emily, do you want to start? <laughs> um, I would say on social media, there's a real difficulty in regulating, um, both because we, the social media companies have positioned themselves not as uh, publishers, which limits our opportunities to actually um, impose consequences. Second, there's a really strong First Amendment protection, which let me be clear, does not actually operate on social media. You have no First Amendment right to use Facebook. Um, you are you are bound by their terms of service. That being said, that perception is that we don't want government regulation. Um, and, and understanding that is really important when we think about that. I would say the third thing is increasingly social media is moving away from these big public platforms to small places where people have um, more intimate chats that even are encrypted, so we can't see them. So I don't think regul I think regulation could help in some situations for social media, but even as they even as they come out, um, social media will adapt and change, and so too will the the disinformation tactics. I would just add that regulations more broadly in the sense of an, an enforcement in terms of. FDA or the FTC, which you know looks at truth in advertising, uh, the FDA has done quite a bit in this space uh, uh, in the context of stem cells and regenerative medicine. They've improved guidance. They've uh, gone after clinics. They've sought uh, uh, lawsuits or permanent injunctions of some of these high-risk clinics. But overall, the industry, since its documentation, at least in the U.S., around 2016 till 2021, has just continued to grow. So um, while there are efforts, even physicians have been um, reprimanded for uh, giving these types of uh, unproven stem cell treatments. But again, uh, there's just not enough enforcement power to go after every single clinic and every single uh, provider. It also, you know, a lot of, you know, disciplining a physician, it's very much complaint based. So there has to be a complaint uh, where a patient actually will complain about it. And then there's a, a body, the, their state boards that will look into it. But um, sometimes, you know, patients feel very disheartened after they feel like they've been duped. They, they may be embarrassed. They, they may not go out there and complain about it, um, you know, and a lot of times they're also in big patient advocacy groups and other patients uh, don't want to hear, maybe you're the one that picked the bad clinic, but I picked the better clinic. And so I'm going to get a better treatment. So um, there, there's a lot out there. It's, it's complex. And so this is one of the reasons why I'm focusing on more on sort of health literacy, patient education and corrections, because if we can kind of, you know, hit the, hit the buyer side of that market, maybe we can, you know, um, uh, curtail the entire market. Thank you, Dr. Master. That gets to a very important point, but one of a central point in this is, is money. Okay, so here's a question, a good question from the audience. So clinics offering unproven medical treatments are making money, and they're making a lot of money. That's why people do this. But those correcting min misinformation do not. How can we best encourage experts to engage in public discourse about science and medicine? And either of you can take that. I, I can start this one. Um, so there, to correct misinformation from, let's say, providers, you know, Dr. Varaka talked about it. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Perrin also mentioned it. How does a physician do it? We don't really know much about whether physicians want to engage in this type of uh, corrections. Um, the other thing is, you know, we work in a medical institution. Physicians are busy people. They don't have time to sit there. And, and as Dr. Raga said, it, it takes multiple situations, it's not just a, oh, by the way, this isn't good. And then the patient will say, oh, okay, I believe you and I'm going to behave. Maybe they might, but not everybody will. And so it, it's, it's ongoing. And so, you know, is the physician the right person to do it? Should there be a counseling service like we have, for example, smoking cessation or, or something along those lines uh, where we have specific people that could use specific techniques to, you know, dissuade people from uh, to, or, or to quit smoking? Maybe some, something like that could be uh, invented for regenerative medicine. Um, but again, it's, it's not easy to do. There are, you know, there's no rewards. In the case of COVID, I know at least at, at Mayo, we have had, at, you know, our, our clinicians have been sort of attacked. Uh, they've been, um, you know, um, uh, 
threatened. And so why would a physician go out of their way to do something like that, to correct that type of information? And sometimes physicians also, they don't necessarily have the best skills to be able to communicate uh, these types of things. So again, it's very complex. And, and so there's a lot of reasons why uh, providers may not necessarily correct misinformation. And, and the same is true of social media as well. The social media platforms have very little financial incentive to address misinformation and sometimes financial incentives not to. Um, if it's viral, if it's keeping people engaged on their platform, uh, that's what they want to sell to advertisers. So needing to put more pressure on uh, platforms who make a lot of money off people using their, their, their platforms and um, need to, to respond effectively. And I think it's difficult to to make, we don't want to be in a position where we necessarily make platforms arbitrators of truth, but there are, there are plenty of known bad actors who are spreading misinformation consistently on these, on these social media sites that they really haven't taken any action against. Um, so thinking about the financial incentives of those sharing it, as well as the financial incentives of those to either respond effectively or not. Thank you. Well, just as a quick antidote, I'll tell you, uh, in my own clinic, sometimes I'll have 15 people to see in a morning. But sometimes, you know, but it, it just chaps your hide when some people uh, say certain things. And you can kind of gauge if maybe they're amenable. So it, it happened just uh, earlier this week. I'll take 15 minutes and explain ex very didactically exactly how an mRNA vaccine works. And I actually think I have convinced a few people you know, shown them and changed their mind where they leave going like, oh, okay, well, then I'll, I think I'll take a vaccine. Some people you'll never convince. So it's sort of a, a you got to feel uh, who you're talking to. Now, um, one, and, and sort of as a segue into that, um, what lessons have we learned over the COVID pandemic about how to communicate the limits of scientific knowledge while reassuring audiences that any given recommendation is really based on existing knowledge, even if it's just an educated guess. That's delicate. I mean, I, I would say we've learned that we need to be doing this earlier, that, that education has got to be a part of the solution, that too many people don't understand how science and medicine work. And so when we tell them it's an educated guess, they don't necessarily know what that means. There's also a deep suspicion that changing one's mind is evidence that science isn't working rather than evidence it is. Um, and so I do think that there's both more clarity needed about the amount of evidence that we have when we are making a recommendation, as well as the foundation for people to understand that. Um, and I would finally add rebuilding trust. Part of it is there's a lot of people who don't trust the medical establishment um, for bad reasons and for good reasons. And so we need to, to figure out what those reasons are and do our best to, to address them. Very I good. would just, oh, mm -hmm. go ahead. Oh, I would just say one, one short thing. Scientific uncertainty is something we've seen in, in the pandemic, right? Uh, wear face masks, don't wear face masks. Social distance six feet, social distance eight feet. Maybe you don't need social distancing. There's, there's up and down, but remember, we all know that science is an iterative process. It, there's, you know, we go with whatever information we have. So I think when people are making and commenting on the pandemic or or, or any area of, of, of novel science, I think there's a, a, you know, a bit of caution and not to hype up certain claims that we really don't have great evidence for. So even though we might be experts, even though we're basing our facts on science, we've got to be a little humble uh, to realize that, hey, maybe we're not getting all the facts straight because the public's not going to, you know, public looks at science as this very certain box, you know, as nice four 90 degree angle corners. Um, it's not a fluid type of thing. And so they may start distrusting science and, you know, scientists because of the, you know, again, the uncertainty and, and, and change in recommendations. So that's something I think the pandemic has also taught us. Well, here's an interesting question. Um, it, it's easier to pay attention to misinformation because it speaks to you than to listen to reason. How do you <laughs> encourage people to go the extra mile making corrections? Do you see a role for media training, social marketing training for physicians and scientists? Yes, I, I think I do. Um, 
we each have our own expertise and assuming that expertise in one domain translates to another is, is definitely not the case. Um, and I think there's both the role for training as well as ways to help people think through what the benefits and risks are. Um, so when we talk to people who perform or don't perform corrections, uh, what they often tell us is, I don't think it's working and I'm afraid that I'm going to, you know, get harmed, that there'll be retaliation. Um, the first we can often speak to by saying, we need to think about for whom it's working and what are some of the bigger issues? Because often when we think about misinformation and correction, we only think of a correction as working as if it reduces those misperceptions. But we also need to think about the way misinformation erodes trust in the scientific process and the system. Um, and so what works is that even defining that is hard. Um, the other thing about retaliation is, is a really tough quandary and I don't have a good answer for that. Most people actually say they like this, they appreciate that. That doesn't mean there aren't bad actors who are going to um, marshal their forces and they're all, we can all think of those salient examples. Um, so I think that's another place where we need to work more effectively with social media platforms uh, to make sure that um, any kind of threatening or violent um, response is, is not acceptable. And we need to put pressure on them to make that the case. Um, Dr. Master, uh, last month, federal dr district court judge Bernal in California ruled in favor of the stem cell clinic chain cell surgical network, um, so cell surgical network, and permitted them to provide unproven stem cell treatments. Can you comment on the implications of this decision? Yeah, I, I, I'm not super, I haven't read the entire case. I know it just came out recently. Um, from my understanding, the judge got a lot of the facts incorrect about how stem cells work. Um, you know, they thought that this, the, basically they thought that this was not considered a drug, whereas the FDA and previous court cases and previous rulings did say uh, it is a drug. It, there's, uh, I don't want to get into the details of it, but basically if you do a lot of manipulation to cells, they don't behave uh, uh, as they normally would if you quickly take them out and maybe put them back in in the exact same, you know, Thing that they're supposed to do. Cells change very easily. So I think the, the I, I, I don't know about maybe potentially the politics around the judge's decision or, or anything like that, but he did not uh, decide in favor of the FDA, whereas previous two previous rulings did. So um, I, I don't, I, I'm presuming the FDA will, uh, with, with the DOJ will repeal um, and um, uh, it will go to another court. So I guess the jury's still out on this decision. Very well. Yeah, misinformation can work its way pretty high. So I have one for Dr. Vraga. Um, during the pandemic, scientists used different platforms to contradict misinformation being presented about COVID-19 vaccine and treatments, but many were then harassed for their efforts. Can this be addressed or should doctors and scientists just expect this kind of treatment if they are going to go public? What can be done to minimize vilification of scientists and doctors releasing the information? And unfortunately, the th the, there are two things that need to be done. One is building social norms, rebuilding our society. And that is, that, that is hard. That is not in the purview of any single scientist. And that's something that is going to take a long time. Um, the other thing is putting pressure on the platforms. Um, as I mentioned, you have no First Amendment right to use Twitter, to use social media you are bound by the terms of service and forcing those terms of service to um, really repudiate and have severe consequences for engaging in those kinds of behaviors, I think is the, one of the only kind of short term solution um, because it is a real problem and it is something that we have to face. And it, it's very much demotivating. It's hard to tell people you should do this at personal risk or professional risk. Um, and so I think forcing, again, finding ways to either regulate or put public pressure on platforms to create terms of service that do not allow for harassment and enforce those terms of service when they actually occur, um, because we know that enforcement is, uh, I'll say, spotty. Okay, well, with that question, we've come to the end of our time. I wanna thank our, our two brilliant uh, speakers uh, for their presentations and the discussion. I also wanna thank uh, Dr. Matthews, for outstanding leadership and commitment, uh, as well as thanking the Baker Institute for hosting this uh, important event. 
Uh, thank you very much.